I'm absolutely thrilled today to be joined by John Gray. He is the author of a very famous book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I think it sold over 50 million copies. So there's a very good chance that those of you listening have indeed read that book and many others of John's books. Um, first of all, John, welcome to the show. It's wonderful to have you here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Happy to be with you. And I'm excited. I've got quite a few different topics that I want to talk to you about. I guess let's kick off with um, lots has happened since you wrote that um, amazing book. And I know you updated it with a with a second one. But now we're kind of in a world that's really turned upside down. As you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic um, when we're recording this. And certainly for me, you know, as a married woman with three children, my husband's now working from home. Um, things are a bit crazy at the moment. So kind of let's kick off, I guess, with from a relationship perspective. Um, more and more women are working now. They're having successful careers. And what are the needs of men versus women? And then we can kind of dive into how things are changing in those dynamics. But from a kind of basic physiological point of view, I know you talk about the differences in sex hormones and the way that men respond in relationships and the way that women are and how importantly, we can actually have an effect on each other's hormones depending on our reactions. Well, you summarized my new book, uh, Beyond Mars and Venus, right there, which is men are from Mars, women are from Venus, really applies when we're in more traditional relationships where women are pretty much the domain is the family and the home and the children, maybe a part-time job, and men are primarily responsible for providing the funds and protection from outside world. That's how it was set up, and that's all changed now, as you pointed out. We're all living a different reality, but it changes our hormonal foundation. And so there's this wonderful new research showing that when women are stressed, their estrogen levels are low. When men are stressed, their testosterone levels are low. And it turns out that when men do things that pump testosterone up, their stress levels go down. And when women do things that increase their estrogen levels, their stress goes down. And another way of looking at your stress going down in a loving relationship is that your heart can open, you know, you can feel the love, you can feel connection. And connection is like one of the, one of the key things that allows estrogen levels to go up. And uh, detachment is actually what allows testosterone to go up. One of the things, many things can allow testosterone to go up, but that's kind of like a, a general dynamic of where we want to go here in terms of our relationships is to understand that when you first talked about your husband staying home working, I remember when I used to work out of the house, I now have an office separate from the house, but here I am writing on the computer all day and she just felt disconnected. Uh, it was kind of like ignored and so forth. And, you know, she knows I'm not ignoring her. She knows I'm working, but the fact that she, I was actually in uh, her, her peripheral vision while I'm basically focusing on something, that's a disconnection. And so when you're noticing disconnection, then you're aware of that rather than if your husband's far away off at work, you're not thinking, oh, we're disconnected, but in that connection. So we're really not designed to be together all the time. Uh, you know, it, I, as a man, we need estrogen too. As a woman, you need testosterone, but primarily if you're stressed, your estrogen is low. So you want to do things to raise your estrogen. Men need to do things to raise their testosterone. So when a man needs space, for example, a woman, doesn't need to take it personally. She realizes that detachment, disconnection actually increases his testosterone, his stress goes down, and then he can be more connected. Other things increase testosterone like urgency, goal orientation, sacrifice. Maybe the biggest one is that feeling of independence as a testosterone producer. And where you feel I need my partner, I depend on them for certain things, that's an estrogen producer. But right then, you know, you might need help around the house doing something while he's busy on the computer. You kind of go, oh, I can't get help from him. So you're constantly reminding yourself that you're disconnected and that estrogen level doesn't have a chance to rise up as opposed to bonding with other activities that produce estrogen. The, the tendency, particularly if you're in a sexual relationship, is to look to your partner for estrogen. Why? Because romantic relationships tend to double your estrogen levels from normal estrogen levels. So that's all very interesting. So, you know, women are often asking me, you know, things have changed. I don't need a man. Why do I even want a man? And I say, ironically, Maslow talked about when your fundamental needs can be met by you, 
then newer needs emerge. So why do you need a man today if you're a woman? It's a good question because when you feel I'm getting my needs met, you're happy. You know, if you're hungry and you need food, you're like suddenly become happy and appreciative and you enjoy whatever you get if you're really hungry. So having said that, women really don't need men for survival and security very much. So what do you need a man for? Well, what you need is not a man, but you need love. Love, you know, like needing security, mm -hmm. needing uh, survival. What you need is love and love when you feel love seen, heard, touched, all those kind of things as, in a, as a priority, that you're special, your estrogen levels go up. And that's what you need a man for, is to take you from feeling good, feeling happy, to feeling great. That's a very practical point of view. Then we're not needy to our partner to change in any way. We're sort of more self-reliant, but we look to our relationship, our intimate relationship for the bonus. And that's a, a positive attitude that I suggest to people. That's interesting what you were saying there, actually, that when when you're around each other and you're at home all the time, you can feel that detachment because I certainly feel like that. It's weird. I've never seen. So we've been married now 20 years this May and I've never spent more time with my husband because usually he was in London and uh, I was away from him. And yet I feel like I get less time with him <laughs> the more he's at home, which is strange, right? Right. Well, it's paradoxical. You know, mm -hmm. we, we long for connection and connection feels really good. But if we get too much connection, it has the opposite effect. Just like we need food, too much food, we become overweight and it doesn't taste as good. So you, you need to have a we all need a balance of connection and separation. And typically on a biological level, men typically have always dealt with the detachment part of it, the disconnection and not disconnecting in a negative way, just coming back to your own sense of independence and then going to your partner to feel that need fulfilled for intimacy, which is so beautiful. Mm. Yeah, really beautiful. The other thing I was uh, listening to some interviews with you um, earlier today and really interesting when you talk about when a man gets annoyed, it's not that his testosterone is going really high. It's that his estrogen is going high. That to me was quite fascinating, quite insightful because I know that for example, I'd say, probably the hardest time ever in our marriage was actually when our children were very, very young um, and the demands were so high. You know, we had two kids within the first two within 18 months and they had reflux and the demands were high. And I guess I was asking more of him with his hours, what long working hours than he was able to give. And that's probably when I found him most angry. Is that because of that dynamic that I'm almost asking him to show more of that love and emotion and affection and that sort of mothering role towards the children? Is that kind of what would, would evoke that response, if you like, when you say that estrogen is higher when a man's angry? Uh, it's a very astute observation. So the foundation is most people consider aggression, anger, irritability in men as high testosterone. But actually it's when he feels his testosterone is low, estrogen tends to rise up. That's when his estrogen goes up. That's when his experience of anger or irritability a grumpiness. You know, if a guy is feeling passive, for example, and you ask him to do something, <laughs> he's going to grumpy mm -hmm. and be irritable. It's, it's kind of like, we're only watching TV. <laughs> What's the big deal? But you see, for him, he's needing to rebuild his testosterone. So when he's working, he's solving problems. Solving problems makes testosterone. But if you're solving problems and there's moments of stress, you know, so here's a solving problem. We feel cool, calm, and confident. Like I'm driving my car. Actually driving your car is a major source of danger if you don't stay alert, but we're confident. We know how to do it. So your testosterone levels go up while you're driving your car. And if you're having traffic jam or you're late or whatever, you're still driving the car, but you're stressed. What that means is that you're using your testosterone up faster and you begin to worry, to be concerned, uh, any negative emotions in men is a sign that his testosterone is going down and his estrogen is going up. That's the negative emotion. Now, if a man has high, I don't even have to say high, just healthy testosterone levels, when his emotion goes up, it's positive emotion. It's feeling affection, love, and warmth. And mm -hmm. the, your experience of him was that started happening when there's a lot of children in the, in the mix because We've done, they've done studies on men and they find that single men have higher testosterone levels than married men. 
actually single men have the highest, generally speaking. And these are all generalizations because I'm, you know, 70 years old and mine are higher than a young man. So there's ways through love and relationship and sexuality, you can keep all the hormones at a healthier level. But generally speaking, when they measure these big groups of men, the single men have the most, then they get into a committed relationship. That means they're spending time with someone they care about more than others. That's estrogen. Love is estrogen on the physical level. Their testosterone level goes down. Then when they get married, average level of men's testosterone goes down even further. And then when men have children and they love those children, it's a natural thing. We all love our kids. Their men's testosterone levels go to the lowest. So men with young children have the lowest testosterone. And so they need more distance to rebuild that testosterone. And yet those children, you want to make sure they take care of, you feel responsible mm -hmm. for them, your wife needs your help. So you're over there continuing to solve those problems, but you're not getting your detachment time. That was the idea of men and from Mars, men need cave time. When I wrote about that, mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand the hormones at all. I just understood that one of the big misinterpretations in relationships is that when men, men tend to go into their cave, they pull away women often misinterpret it as he must be mad at her or he doesn't love her or she's done something wrong because often women will go into their cave when she's mad at him and she yeah. doesn't trust him <laughs> and she's she punishing is. him <laughs> so, so so that's her experience and then his he could be mad at you and that's he needs to go to his cave to rebuild but without being upset with you in any way at all he just needs his time to detach to come back you know, when people say, well, why hasn't people known this before? Actually, if you go back to the time of Buddha and before that, particularly men were taught how to meditate. And meditation was the major stress reducer besides, you know, spiritual thing. It was a very practical thing because at the end of the day, when men's testosterone levels are low, they need to take some time to forget their problems, forget responsibilities, don't do anything that will use up your testosterone, but relax, but stay focused. That's a meditation technique. And it rebuilds testosterone and it makes you feel more friendly and loving and nice as a result of taking that separate time. And now we don't have that, but often men are watching the news and, you know, in the fifties, they would read their newspaper. <laughs> it's kind of like a block, you know, I'm in my cave. Yeah. I've got yeah. A newspaper yeah, yeah. The newspaper would go up tall. And <laughs> <laughs> part of my own experience of all this was when I, uh, Mary Bonnie, we were married 34 years. She's passed now. But uh, when, when we got together and we got married, we're living in a house. I noticed I started ordering magazines. I don't know why I did it. And I wondered, why am I reading magazines when I come home? So I thought I would experiment. And so I put down the magazine. And literally within a couple of minutes, Bonnie came downstairs and asked me to do something. <laughs> so it, it was like little antennas went up in her brain and said, uh, inactive man can get help. You know, we had to, <laughs> so trying to create a life I definitely taken you up on that as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's funny actually you say that. What I noticed in him was he would, at that stage, he would very much go off like mountain biking or doing CrossFit or going out with the lads and having a few drinks and, you know, showing up at 3 a.m. And that makes so much sense now because he was obviously like rebuilding himself, whereas now the children are a bit older there's less of that. What makes me curious is like, as someone who suffered actually with PCOS, you know, that's known for women to have higher levels of male hormones and higher levels of androgens. Have you found that kind of dynamic changes things at all? Like in those women, uh, how is it different, for example? Well, there's a whole host of challenges that go along with any woman. It's just <laughs> that they have a health condition where it's pretty yeah. consistent. But it's, it's actually pretty consistent with what a lot of women experience today, just being more independent. And that is feeling overwhelmed, higher mm -hmm. stress levels, inability to experience orgasm, inability to experience interest in sex. And sometimes when you're way on your male side as a woman, it's two different types of reactions that I've seen in women is when they're very independent, they're wanting to have sex, but their partner doesn't wanna have sex with them. And when they have sex, it's not as fulfilling as they, as it could be, maybe they're having sex, enjoying it, but there's the man loses interest in her. And that's because part of men's bonding happens when women's estrogen levels go very, very high. And that's been proven. Uh, when a woman's estrogen is high at the time of ovulation, her estrogen will mm. tend to double. Uh, at that time, she puts out pheromones, a smell that increases a man's testosterone. 
And very interesting, at that time, when her estrogen levels are rising up, she will experience a, a, an increased desire for sex. And it will have the effect of being in the presence of a man who has higher testosterone levels. She will feel even more increased desire for sex. So how we, where our hormones are tend to attract our partner or create a neutral response to our partner. So there's challenges when women, you know, one of the common things for women when they're on their male side is feeling overwhelmed. And there's so much to do, there's not enough time. And that's what women commonly say, not enough time, but actually it's an attitude of not enough. So it's not enough attention from my partner. It's not enough romance from my partner. It's not enough support in my life. And it's kind of like, you know, you're driving really fast in a car where a man, when he drives fast in a car, often likes it, you know, <laughs> it's because we have an off switch. Generally, women haven't developed the off switch. You can develop it. And the off switch for a woman is to talk about <clears throat> her feelings talk about what's going on inside of her. That's a very powerful off switch. It's as though she needs to remember what's going on in her life to sort it out. Yeah. And for a man, he just goes straight to off switch. And then after that, he remembers what's most important in his life, which is his wife and his children and the things that are of value for him. Yeah. So he needs to kind of retreat to get that back. That's interesting what you say there, because I know like a lot of successful women, for example, they do find that their relationship is a bit of a struggle and that they don't feel like their partner's interested in them. And that's because, as you say, right, their estrogen levels are lower. So now you haven't got that balance between the two. What happens then when you've, and, and that's difficult as well, because I think women tend to take that very personally. Um, what happens though, when you've got a woman who just isn't feeling, like I see this as well, a lot of women will encounter this around perimenopause in particular, that suddenly they're just like switched off from sex. They're not interested. And that, that causes friction as well. Um, what's happening there when the woman is kind of shutting off a little bit from the man? Well, there's a, a lot of things, a lot of approaches because it were complex, but one, one simple aspect is that her estrogen levels are no longer sustained like they used to be. And when her estrogen levels are high, a man will be more attracted to you. If there, there's literally like two kinds of sex that a woman can have. And it's a little fun. It's an interesting story. You heard me tell it before, but it's, it's that a long time ago, women often were, would be labeled by the medical society as hysterical. And if you actually looked at, and then later in 1900, we're still labeling in the medical society when women were depressed or anxious, they called it hyster hysteria. Okay. And the treatment for that was the first medical invention, which was a paddle machine that would stimulate and masturbate a woman to having an orgasm. Okay. Now what that did is her estrogen levels were too high. And when a woman's estrogen levels are too high, if she masturbates, has something not personal masturbate her, her testosterone levels will start to come back into balance. We see women generally don't need that today because they're already on their male side. But when they're on their male side and they come back to their female side, there's like a surge of sort of irrational emotions. And that pushes her back to her male side to deny those, suppress those emotions by staying busy. So when we go out of balance, we can keep going out of balance to prevent us from feeling the buildup of emotions. If you're a woman on your female side, and then you could also take a vibrator and you'd have this, I'm doing it myself kind of thing. So that's one, and have an orgasm. Some women do have orgasms using a vibrator without a man, not all, but some do. And sometimes over uh, my experience of counseling women, and there's no big study on this, is it tends to take longer and longer and longer over time. So you're using a vibrator, to get you off. What you're doing there is you're doing it yourself and you're also stimulating some estrogen. So... What that, what, what that does is doesn't take you to the highest level of estrogen, which makes you very attractive to your husband, because what makes you attractive to your husband or to men is, is literally the smells that come out. These are all subconscious things, unconscious reactions we have when a woman's estrogen goes very high. And so it actually inhibits her ability for estrogen to go high. She can have climaxes, but it's kind of like a man's climax. It's more like a sneeze. It's not a surrendering and opening the heart. It's not a union. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a different experience, allowing a man to 
adore you, touch you, please you, give to you. And he has to have the skills to do that. That's a different kind of an orgasm. And I've discuss, discussed this with women who, this is no studies. This is just my own opinion and experience of having women practice some of the techniques I teach in my book, uh, Mars, Venus in the Bedroom, which very, it's very clear. When are you giving? When are you giving to yourself? When are you receiving from your partner? And it, so those are different variations of, of sex. So it's really what holds couples together, in my experience, is couples who enjoy sex with each other, and they enjoy sex with each other. Historically, women that didn't necessarily enjoy sex with their husband, it was more of a, a duty. And the passion went away. Everybody knew the passion went away. It was like that was the honeymoon period in the beginning, because there's a newness to stimulate higher levels of, of hormones. But once the newness goes away, it was accepted that you stopped having sex or it wasn't as exciting and fulfilling. Well, when you practice, when, when people get to that stage now after seven or eight years and for younger people, even after you know three months, the passion goes away. Then people go, well, then I want another relationship. People want to experience this excitement, this passion with their partner. And they're led to believe like experts like me and many other books that it's possible but it's their own experience. They kind of go, I want this. And can they achieve it? Well, you need good relationship skills. You need polarity in the relationship, which is my expertise, and that will sustain it. But there's a lot of other skills that go along with it. For example, a man, to keep a woman's estrogen levels high in the relationship, he needs to desire her. He needs to feel strong desire. And that when she feels desired, there's, his attention goes to her. His affection goes to her. And that is another thing of, of biological foundation. The Japanese did research on, on men and they found that when men ejaculate more than uh, twice a week, more than once a week with their partner, their testosterone levels remain at kind of a half level and that's their normal level. If a man ejaculates on Saturday night, for example, what they found is if he doesn't ejaculate for six days on the seventh day, his testosterone levels double. And right. that in meaning he makes love in a different way. He's, you know, <laughs> adoring you, desiring you just like it was in the beginning. So you can bring it back. So that's another aspect of sustaining the passion is, is regulating how much you do. Now it doesn't have to be like a, a religious dogma, but just to know that if it's starting to wane, try it for the man to try going six days without ejaculating and it starts to come back. Now, if they've stopped having sex for months, then they have to just start every once a week and just do it, and he has to practice not masturbating. Quite often, men, when they're not fully enjoying sex with their wives today, it's very, quite common for them to seek that passion, and they can experience a glimpse of it by, by, by masturbating to pornography, which has become rampant. And it's, it's so shame-inducing, but it also it's proven it lowers your testosterone as a man, which lowers your interest for your wife because you need higher levels of testosterone to sustain interest in someone you love than someone you don't love. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. When, when you, but when then you that says someone, we need time away as well, right? So you like yeah. a balanced relationship is like less is more. And also you need time apart if you're really going to keep that passion element alive. Absolutely. You know, part of my, I didn't know it at the time, but my job is I go away for, you know, three days, a couple of times every month. And I'm in some other country, I'm teaching somewhere in my job and I come back and we just have great sex. It was, and you know, for 34 years, this was, and even then I, I'm so sort of grounded in just doing what I feel, not what everybody tells me to do. But it was kind of awkward for me because people always said, you know, how often do you have sex? Like quantity is the measure of a good relationship. And I would just be honest. I'd say, well, we have great sex, but generally once a week and that's all I need. <laughs> and she's happy with that, too. And, and people just, you know, it didn't make sense to them. Now we have the research that shows it's really management of the sexual energies. And uh, now then there's something else that I also practice many times over those years, and that is learning how to have sex without ejaculating. That's a sort of advanced technique for men to practice and for women to practice with their this partners. This is kind of like tantric sex. That's right. There's, yeah. there's a tantric sex and then there's Taoist sex. These are ancient traditions that the more enlightened people did. Uh, you know, you have to be, you have to free yourself from this addiction to the release and then your energy builds until then you have to start having orgasms without ejaculating. 
And that's a whole system, which is, uh, I don't teach that publicly, haven't written any books on it. I have, I have private students I teach that to. It's, it's, you know, you have to get very intimate about describing processes. Mm, yeah, for sure. It was interesting, actually, when I was uh, watching some of your content, you were talking about the difference with meditation and the different styles of meditation and how they can, that can impact hormones. Because it was particularly interesting to me because I, um, I like to use sort of mantra based meditation quite a lot less guided I've kind of learned to sort of do it myself but I think you were describing that in more of a guided meditation in men that actually could lower potentially lower testosterone um I might be recalling this wrongly but can you kind of elaborate on that because I know like oh, meditation lots of people are doing it now yeah lots of people are doing it and that I that was how I grew up in meditation I've been doing it for 50 years I started with mantra meditation I learned transcendental meditation uh, within a year, I, I became a teacher of transcendental meditation. Then I studied with the Maharishi who brought it to the West and became his personal assistant for nine years. So I love mantra meditation. I, I do it occasionally now. There's so many different kinds of meditation that you can do, but that's a real good foundation. And if you're getting benefit from your meditation and you're doing mantra meditation, it's great. Uh, if it ever becomes a little boring or lack, lackluster, then there's other ways to do it. But see what, what happens for you as a busy woman, I presume, mm -hmm. uh, when you do that mantra meditation, that's more what the Buddha taught uh, for men. But because you're kind of out there on your masculine side, it can be very helpful for you. However, I'd recommend also sometimes trying uh, after you've been doing your meditation to rebuild your testosterone that you lost as a woman, they still, if they make testosterone, they still need to rebuild it. There's not to such high levels. Uh, then, and, and let me back up for a moment. When, if you go to India, you'll see that mainly men would do the meditation, not the women. There would always be some exceptional women who were already more a balance of their masculine and feminine side. But to a great extent, there's all these wonderful guided meditations that people do, and that can help produce the estrogen. Also, just simply listening to music while you meditate can be producing estrogen while you're doing your mantra, uh, or being, uh, in, in That's a nice interesting because I did that naturally. As I started to sort of tire of it, I would put music on. And then now I've kind of transitioned almost to not always even meditating, but focusing on breath work and sort of inner connection and gratitude and more visualization. I, find, I like to be quite playful with it, I find. Yeah. So the gratitude, the gratitude is the feminine side of you. Oh. And the visualization is a blend of the masculine and feminine. So that's where I go a lot. Um, in terms of my meditation experience. One is at the masculine side, which is quiet, mantra, focusing, and very relaxed though. And part of that was the theme of what Maharishi brought when he, he really revolutionized meditation for the West. Now we have different variations that are common, but what he focused on is that meditation wasn't this strenuous concentration, empty your mind kind of a thing. He brought the feminine side of it. He says, it's easy, it's effortless, Notice when your mind wanders off of the meditation, off of the mantra to easily effortlessly come back. So he was bringing that feminine quality into the meditation as opposed to this, you know, this forceful focus that you that, that was really being taught in the old days for men primarily, because that focus was allowing them to rebuild their testosterone. So, it, but having said that, there, there's manifestation techniques, you know, for me, uh, like, uh, I wanted to buy a new car and I couldn't find, figure out the color. So I kept doing my meditation on, on the right color. And at a certain point, there was one color that just continued to be effortless and easy. And then I kept meditating on that. And then boom, it arrived at the dealership and I got it. So they're at the right time. So this is the idea of attracting opportunity. People, you know, they saw that uh, uh, movie, The Law of Attraction. And yeah. just there's truth to that. You know, that's the feminine side. You know, I remember before the book, there's a, a woman who'd been teaching that a lot. And mostly it was like 800 women that would come because this is the essence. What women have to realize is they have the power of attraction to draw in opportunity. And it's the masculine side that says, OK, now I'm going to make use of it and, and achieve my goals. So there's, there's, you know, a balance of the masculine and feminine. Mm, One is I bringing guess. feeling into it. And when you're bringing feeling, the gratitude, that's just a beautiful meditation. And you can do so many things. It doesn't just have to be mantra, mantra, but 
just to shorten this conversation, I remember when Maharishi, he was teaching the mantra mantra meditation. Then he went to the advanced technique. He said, now it's time to use more of imagination. And, and that's also the case in Tibet and so forth. Once you calm the mind, now you, you can, uh, by, by staying in that state, you energize your imagination. See, a lot of people say, okay, imagine having what you want. And it doesn't really feel like they have it as opposed to imagine it. And you're right there and you have it. Now your frequency, you become accustomed to that. You become familiar with that. Even when, when you know, Minifer Mars, that book, it was a big sensation. It still is, but for six years, it was the number one best-selling book on the New York Times list in the world, okay? It was the biggest selling book. But every day I was meditating on Men from Mars, number one, <laughs> Men from Mars, number one, people coming up to me saying, oh, your book changed my life. Your book changed my life. I love it. I still get that, but I don't, that's not my big meditation. I stopped. I said, okay, this is enough at one point. So but I that's think like that using our, the law of attraction then, right? To achieve that, what you want. That's right. I, that yeah that that's, that's exactly really right interesting because i it was funny because the other day because i'm relatively new i'll tell you when i started like the whole sort of meditation practice I'm relatively new to it because i'm a former lawyer who was deeply suspicious of all of this and just extremely logical um but i uh i had a meditation recently where i was i was imagining i wanted to, i was sort of more asking a question if i'm on the right track show me a sign and then the sign that came into my head was I wanted to see a deer and you never know when it's gonna show up, right? And then a few days later, I went for a walk in the woods and it was dusk and three deer show up at the same time. And they're kind of just waiting in the wings. And it was just mystifying. It was beautiful because of the meditation that I'd had. And then they were kind of around me. They were sort of almost dancing, like they went off and then they came back. And it was just this incredible experience that some people might say is coincidental. Um, I believe that was, you know, part of what I was, what I'd asked for it. Um, you know, people could could practically look at that even from the point of view of it awakened your intuition. I mean, we do believe in intuition mm -hmm. can help guide us. And there's an inner knowing that there's there's more to what's going on in the world than what we see. We know that our brain is limited to certain frequencies. And we know and visually there's all these other frequencies that we can't see or hear, but animals can hear some of them. But, you know, so many different ways to describe that. But the truth is when you start experiencing that what you love, what you, you can attract things in your life, it's quite amazing. So one book was written, I remember it was a Celestine prophecy. And he was talking about as you align yourself with your soul, you see more and more coincidences. And of course, it's the result of you being intentional about what you want to happen. So one of the things people can do to see how this works is just say my intention after your meditation, then you focus on your intention for the day is during the day today, I want to feel a surge of happiness. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, that's it. That's a really powerful one is I just want to feel this surge of great happiness and joy to be alive and then drop it. And then later on in the day, something will happen and you'll feel a surge of happiness. And then it's very important to then say, thank you. And that little thank you is the acknowledgement that you've got that. And you were talking about looking for signs. I, again, that's an estrogen stimulator, which is you're depending upon the omens or the signs. Anytime you're depending on something to know something of value for you, it produces estrogen. As a man, I want to be producing both testosterone and estrogen. So I love that. I look at little clocks. If ever it says uh, my birthday, 1228. I, I go, oh, I'm on the right track. I always say, thank you. And I look at what I was thinking at that time and I feel good about it. Another thing I do is I did for many years, I just practiced whenever I got into 1111 or 1212 or any kind of significant fun number. Uh, I would then take the time like a minute until it changed on the digital clock in my car. I would just take that time to focus on what do I want in my life? What do I want in my life? What do I want in my life? So many people are not even aware of what they want until they see mm. something and then they go, I want it. Find in your heart, what am I, where am I going? You know, what am I wanting? What else am I wanting? And just feel that peacefully. It's just to become aware of that part of you. And it's as though you're just acknowledging to the universe, this is what I want. Okay. And what can come to me? Great. Yeah, it's so true. And that is, it, um, the regular listeners of the podcast will know this, but when I, um, I suffered really badly with depression after I had my children. 
And I then, um, I think you talk about this actually, about how, you know, stress will affect your immune system. And it did mine. And I ended up hospitalized with double pneumonia. And it was the lucidity of the very high fevers. I'd been, you know, thinking of suicide for so long and almost attracting that experience that when I then went through this, like being rushed into hospital, unable to see my children, it was suspected lung cancer originally, I then uh, had this sort of lucidity and was able to enter that state for the very first time because I wasn't a meditator at the time. And it was my first really embarking upon, what do I want? I want to see my children grow up and becoming really intentional um, about that path. And I know a lot of people are struggling at the moment because we are going through this ruckus. And I think the thing that unifies us is worldwide, everybody is having this in different ways. We're having a similar experience or set of circumstances. What would you say to people who struggle with controlling their mood with because you talked about vibration there and sometimes people can be like on a very low vibration particularly fear which is difficult to come out of and when I look at sort of the the frequencies that we can go through Esther Hicks would very much advise that actually you can't necessarily go from fear or depression right up to joy and love but maybe you can just raise yourself incrementally by the next best vibration What have you found affects people in terms of mood and stability, um, particularly in tough times like now? I like Esther a lot. When I was referring to the the people who taught that before The Secret, they took a lot of Esther's work. And Esther took a lot of her work from Seth. And in the beginning, if you look at Esther's work, she wasn't saying, she was saying, don't dwell on negativity at all until I had a few dinners with her and explained to her that you have to shift from... negative to a little less negative to a little less negative a little less negative. it's a journey for what 40 years i've been teaching something called the feeling letter technique which is if you're upset let's say you're frustrated you feel it you 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 give words to label it so you feel it you want to feel your emotions and use your that's your right brain then you use your left brain to identify it, give it a word then analyze it briefly what is making me feel this way with a perspective of you are generating it. Okay, so the world makes me feel this way, but what's my interpretation of the world making me feel this way? So you're on your male and female sides. Again, you're analyzing, but you're also feeling. Then what you do is you say, okay, what else am I feeling? The what else is the most important thing. You go from whatever emotion you're feeling to a deeper level and then to a deeper level and to a deeper level. And then ask yourself again, what do I want? And your wants start to purify. Esther was always talking about rockets of desire. You've got to feel your rockets of desire. That's what creates transformation. What you need is the rockets of desire that come from a pure heart. And we all have a pure heart if we can temporarily release any negative emotions. So let me give a quick example of how you can process negative emotion. Something is frustrating you or makes you angry. So you feel that. And then what's making me feel angry? Even if you're not really good at analyzing, it's okay. Particularly for women, all you have to do is just First, focus on I'm feeling angry. What is making me feel angry? And it can even be not your own thoughts. It can be the outer world makes me angry. Then you ask yourself the next question, which is uh, what am I disappointed about? You see, any type of upset is always the frustration of a disappointment. So now what is my disappointment right now? And that makes me feel sad. Give yourself the softness. Then you go into, well, why is that painful? My sadness and, and, and disappointment because underneath that is always the concern that I'll never get what I want or that I did the wrong thing or it's not gonna happen. So you talk to anybody who's angry, for example, and you could say to them, you shouldn't do this, but if you said to them, you know, you're you're really angry, but really you're afraid. They'll say, no, I'm not afraid. Cause see, that's a, a, we defend ourselves from feeling the deeper emotions. If you really go down deep behind all of our stressful emotions is feeling shame. Uh, we're, We're embarrassed to point out that uh, we don't feel good enough, we feel unworthy, and there's some shame or there's some guilt. And we all desperately try to look like we're right all the time. So learning to go deep inside. And then what you learn to do is realize that 90% of anything that upsets you now is actually not about right now at all. It's about something in your past. And and then you wake up the uh, connection between you and the person you were when you were a child and you didn't yet have a brain to protect you and an- analyze the world correctly. So there's a lot for people to learn about gender intelligence. That's what we talked about first, but then there's emotional intelligence, how to process negativity. So you're not throwing it around thinking the world's making you feel what you feel, but actually the world is a projection to help you get in touch with how you feel. 
to clean out the negativity so your positive feelings can emerge and then the universe can resonate with that and bring to you those wonderful coincidences and opportunities. Because mm. it matches the vibration that you are on, right? So, which right, is tough, right? Because right? the people that uh, well, are going through a hard time are almost then in danger of attracting more of the same. Well, here's here's the great the great gift of the universe. Okay, you talked about you had that lucid moment while you were afraid of dying, right? Mm. Okay, so what's going on is you're a very independent woman. You're stressed out because all stress in women is being too far on your male side, not enough on your female side. So you got put in a situation that forced you to go over to your female side. Yeah, and I did, then because I you, felt you, love you, at that point. Yeah, mm -hmm. you just want, you see, when you're way on your male side and you go back to your female side, there's a moment where both are active and that was your lucidity. If you look at, I look at my bookshelf over here and I have one of the, some of the books I really enjoyed reading were the sex lives of famous uh, musicians. Another one, sex lives of politicians, sex lives of, of uh, famous writers. And they were all tormented. You see, these are people who access their creative genius. And we all have it inside of us. We have to just learn how to access our unique creative genius. And for them, it was like they, they'd be doing their, they, they'd be on their very, very disciplined people, very responsible, very talented and had developed talents. But their muse was usually a woman uh, either they madly in love with or a woman who left them for another man who caused massive torment. But either way, it's they get into these strong emotional states and often then they would take drugs and whatever to cope with these strong, this intensity of their female side as they go back and forth from their male to female side. The good news is we don't have to be tormented in our life in order to have that lucidity and that clarity and that motivation and that genius coming forth. We just, in my experience, I don't have any of that. Uh, I've had things happen to me to have my creative potential come forth. You know, my brother committed suicide and you know, I had to process that. My mother died in an accident, had to process that. My father was found dead in the trunk of his car, had to process that. You know, before I married Bonnie 34, 38 years ago, I was married to another woman for two years and she left me for another man. I had to process that. <laughs> so wow. it's not like my life wow. is all roses, but I know how to process these emotions. And each time it increases my genius, my capacity to grow in love, my capacity to forgive, my ca capacity to go with the flow. And, and manifest my potential and fulfill my destiny. It's, it's not like a life is uh, always green grass all the time, but how do you experience that? I look back at my life and go, I'm just so blessed and so gifted. You know, my wife, after I tell you all those things, my wife would always say, John's the luckiest man you'll ever meet <laughs> because that's my attitude. And also those are negative things that happen. But for me, my growth is massive. So this is yeah. the power of learning to process our feelings. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, actually, because when I look back at that event, it wasn't so much about I wasn't afraid of dying. I suddenly woke up to the fact that I wanted to see my kids grow up. I thought they'd be better without me. It was like a, a warped sense of reality. But then I became in touch with myself. And as you say, it was very much a female creative side that I accessed, which was like, I want to see my kids go. I want to be their mom and watch them grow. And then my health turned around. But I still, I guess, I still have questions and maybe you can answer some of these because I'd love to help anybody listening who struggles. You talked about your brother there who had depression and he had bipolar, didn't he? Um, yes. Because so many people struggle with it. And I myself was actually put on the third time that I had it. I was then prescribed bipolar medication. I was told that I would be on those for the rest of my life. I'm completely medication free now, but it's a process. Meditation has been part of that. For people that are listening and struggling, depression, I almost find anxiety is in some respects easier to solve because feelings of anxiety, you can address it with some of the practices we've spoken about. But depression is such a, a low vibration and a feeling of worthlessness, right? In your deep within yourself, I think, um, is how I felt. And almost as if you shouldn't be here. It's very difficult. And I know that you have some natural therapies. Like I never took this, but you talk about lithium, for example, in um, lithium orita, isn't it? Which I, I was never prescribed. I was prescribed something else, Seroquel, I think, which was a different bipolar yeah. med. Um, well, uh, psychiatrists prescribe lithium carbonate. I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't prescribe drugs. I don't take any drugs. I don't recommend drugs. I recommend positive mindset and good diet, good nutrition. And sometimes you need extra supplements when you're going through cr crisis. Mm -hmm. And certainly bipolar is crisis. Okay. So what you need to do is you have to practice the mindsets like you use meditation and lifestyle changes. 
and wisdom. Now, geniuses, most geniuses have bipolar tendency, just to let you know, that's, that's also well known. The brain's a little different. But having said that, there's something that happens when you're super stressed and you're a genius, you tend to be uh, more capable of going out of balance because you've got a wider range. And so in that wide range, you can, when you're stressed in a, in a, high, in a ma massive state or a depressed state, you're using up brain minerals faster than usual to try to cope. And lithium orotate is a very powerful one to help the brain cope if you have the right mindsets. And lithium is orotate is tiny, tiny doses of a natural mineral. It's all natural, lithium orotate. You can get it in Europe. It's wonderful. If you have bipolar tendencies, go off, gradually go with your natural doctor who tells you to do this, but he'll say something like titrate off your medication. You can't ever go off a of medication quickly. Then you gradually, while you're doing that, you can also be taking like eight and a half or nine milligrams of lithium orotate. Lithium orotate is very different from carbonate. Carbonate causes side effects. Mm, carbonate causes excessive kind of weight gain as well, doesn't it? So with the lithium yes. orotate, have you found that people then, they supplement with that for a period of time or have they then needed that on a more ongoing basis? No, they can do it for a few years and be drop off of it once they get the, the wiring back in the brain. And they have to be in a stress-free state for quite a while to not need the lithium. I, I used to do it and I, I, years ago I stopped. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, and again, we're not talking about lithium that doctors prescribe. We're no, talking about no. over-the-counter lithium, lithium orotate. Yeah, in micro amounts, which help. Um, That's right. You would never want the big doses. That's why lithium carbonate is toxic is you take about 500 times more the dose and anything good that much more is not good for you. Yeah, exactly. Because I think you also talk about how sometimes people will then, they also get extreme cravings for sugar as well because they're trying to create that effect, um, getting a more kind of high effect. And diet plays a big part, doesn't it, in this? Yes, yes. Sugar yeah. should be greatly avoided when people are bipolar. Anybody who has anxiety, sugar should be avoided. You can test it. Go two days without sugar, then take your, your sugar and your anxiety will increase. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to kind of talk to you about it all. Um, before you um, go, just what I'm, I'm curious there, you were saying you've read a lot of books yourself in terms of like musicians and, and their sex lives and things like that. What have you found is, is there a book that along the way just kind of deeply inspired you apart from obviously the meditation side of things um, and the time that you spent in India? Is there a book or a, or a teacher that inspired you in your early days of this? Well, in my spiritual journey, it certainly wasn't sex lives of famous people. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> um, or, it was basically, it was my awakening happened with uh, uh, Yogananda's book, uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, Ramana Maharshi's books. Uh, these were two Hindu type people who really awakened me uh, to more of the Eastern ideas to begin integrating them into my Western life. They were very, very influential for me to sort of recognize almost like a fantastic uh, Marvel comic book, what's possible. And much of that I did realize by the age 28, uh, it was, it's been quite an amazing ride. I mean, I'm still blown away by my continued meditation experiences, how it you know, creates abundance in my life. I walk through the woods and the trees, the redwood trees seem like they're giant gods. I mean, I have such a connection with nature now uh, and the awesomeness of it, kind of like when I was a younger person, not having all this meditation experience. If I went to the Grand Canyon for the first, you know, 10 minutes, there's that sense of awe. Well, mm -hmm. to walk outside and just feel that awe of, to nature is, is shocking to me. <laughs> I mean, I never felt that in my life before. I, but so there's, a, there's a never ending potential of growth. It's just a gradual growth. And if you're practicing regularly, it tends to be sustained and, and definitely worthwhile. And people always ask me why I came up and how I came up with the Mars Venus ideas is because whenever Bonnie would upset me, I had a, a go-to place to take away that upset that was meditation and then reflect on how did I contribute to that problem as opposed to making her responsible for my happiness. I could always go to that happy place where, okay, let me back off, not be dependent on her for my happiness, come back to feeling good, open my heart. And then do, you know, a reflection on how did I contribute to that problem? It's the ultimate 
accountability when you have the source of happiness within yourself you don't have to blame others so much yeah absolutely 100 percent. have you found them with women actually that rather than talking to their partners actually talking to their girlfriends is almost a better way to refresh because i know you say like women need to need that talking therapy right to kind of work through things yes they do and the again once the once to get to the ultimate or the next step besides talking to your girlfriends is talking to your intimate partner about things that are not about them. So you can share it. Because see, men, men can't always relate to what you say because our perspective is different. You know, you could tell me there was a lot of traffic today and I say, no problem, I just put on the stereo. But you're feeling rushed. And so, so, so the behavioral things happen. My mind may not relate to it or connect to it, but if you share an emotion, and that's estrogen, if you actually feel the emotion that what's happening in your life is producing, a man can always connect with the emotion and then feel a sense of empathy. But he needs a little training to do that, just as she needs training to fully bring forth the emotion, which he will connect with. But then what he'll tend to do right away, don't cry, don't be upset, you should just do this, don't worry. About it. He'll minimize it. That's what people do when people get emotional, they minimize, as mm-hmm. opposed to you just have to have enough balance inside yourself to say, oh, really? and you're training him, you don't have to say anything. I just need to process out loud and it feels really, really good. So that's the second level up. And the third level up is then you can process your feelings that may be triggered by him. And and that's gonna be the most challenging for a man to hear because you're trying to change him, he'll get defensive. But if he's learned first by hearing the, the emotions that come up in your life that are not dependent on him, he can easily hear that with a little training. The next one is, And that's what you would share with your girlfriends. Because when you're sharing with your girlfriends, you're not asking them to change. You just want them to listen. So if you can communicate to to a man, you just want him to listen. It's pretty easy for him to listen. But when you're communicating about the relationship, which you're not doing with your girlfriends, you're talking about your husband or other things. So when somebody can hear your emotions without feeling like you're trying to change them in any way, you can get the best empathy that way from the person that loves you the most. So there's higher levels to all of this that we can get to. But, you know, if Bonnie was really upset with me. She'd never share those feelings with me. She'd talk about it with her girlfriends. Then she'd come back in a more heartfelt centered way and say, you know, when you didn't call, I was worried. I was so scared. And I just want to talk about my reactions inside. You don't have to say anything or do anything. Just take it into consideration. And she also said a magic phrase that every woman can really Uh, benefit from is she'd say, and this is not a big deal, John, I just need you to hear it. Boy, when she'd do that, I'm like right there. But women have a tendency when they need to be heard to magnify, you know, it's kind of like you're not listening, let me say it louder. Mm -hmm. And when you say when when a woman magnifies, men tend to minimize, it's like, well, it's not such a big deal, or don't worry about it. It's just a natural polarity here. So if you just preface it by you know, this is not a big deal. It's not that important, but I need you to, I just want to process this and have you understand what I'm going through. Boom. He's going to give you his full attention for a little while, you know, because you're really, it, the, what holds a man's attention is vulnerability, emotion, and authenticity. And sometimes people confuse authenticity with sharing everything at any time. I mean, you can be totally authentic with your children and not going to tell them you're worried about paying the rent. <laughs> So there's appropriateness in every situation. Yeah, that's very true. And you almost, I guess, as you say, like not letting them off the hook, but you're not expecting them to change as a result, because that's when the confrontation comes, doesn't it? Where it's and I um, it's very hard to ever come back. I'm not a big fan of arguments for the simple reason that I'm the type of person that finds it hard to unlisten to something that was said, right? So I'd rather that I never said that in the first place because it's quite, I find it very difficult to take it back, right? You can't, you can't unsay a word, can you? It's said now. Um, well, I, I would challenge you to realize that that is, that is something you can work on to reckon. Here's what I would like to say for everybody going through COVID, all right? We have a higher self, we have a lower self and we are our higher self. We are this beautiful spiritual being. But when stress reactions occur in the body chronically, blood flow stops to the front part of the brain. And in that place, we tend to express parts of us which are not really us, but they're things we inherited. So it might be during an argument, somebody says, you know, I never loved you anyway, or we should just quit. We should get a divorce. This just isn't working. And then we think, oh, now they revealed their true colors and we don't let go of that instead of realizing, no, 
they reveal the part of them that they become when they're way, way out of balance. And that's not the person I loved. So I think it's a really helpful thing to do rewrites and say, okay, I, I, with an apology, you know, I want to apologize for what I said. It's not what I meant. It's just something that came out of me. And because we often think these things that come out of us are really the real truth. And if it's negative, it's generally not the real truth. So that's a way of looking at it that I have. Yeah, that's it's really, really nice interesting to... perspective on it, actually, because a lot of people will say things, won't they, in the heat of the moment, but they actually don't really mean um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's almost coming from their past and their conditioning or a part of themselves that they haven't truly connected with or dealt with. Yeah. And it, it could also, it is all of that. And on a very simple level, it could simply be what happens when, let's say you have resentments or anger and you keep pushing it down. When it comes out, it comes out very distorted. Mm. You see, it's, it's, it's like right now what I feel, but it's not right now what I feel. I felt it before and before and before and before, just like if you know, if you came home and your partner left the lights on, you'd be like, hey, you forgot to turn off the lights. But if you had 10 things that happened <laughs> that bad that day, you say, can't you at least turn out the lights? <laughs> or if maybe 50 times in the past, he hadn't turned out the lights. When are you ever going to turn out the light? You see, the actual action <laughs> of turning out the light is a little not a big deal, but it becomes a big deal when we live in the past. What we want to do is not bring the past into the now or at least acknowledge it and free ourselves from, you know, justifying our upsets by what's happened in the past. And then you can say, well, if somebody has cheated you in the past, you just forget that. And you go, no, you know, but you don't have to have resentment about it. You can let go of resentment. Now you have something called wisdom and go, you know, you're someone I can't trust. I wish you well, but I'm not going to do that business deal with you again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's true. And what, and for, for sort of typical, you mentioned it a few times that you, women are kind of rushing, particularly when they're sort of type A personalities, they're always busy there. There's almost like there isn't a stop button. Like, how can they access that side then and understand that they can kind of dial things back a bit? It doesn't, because actually, in my experience, it doesn't lead necessarily to higher and greater achievement, because actually, you become less productive, less effective, and certainly less create or I've found less creative like a walk in the forest will make me way more creative than trying to go 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 at something that's um, such great wisdom it's disciplining ourselves to know what works we have to re be first be a buddha taught the first thing you get first enlightenment is to realize it's not working what i'm doing he called it the awareness of suffering i'm actually creating my suffering here then you look at what's the cause of it and i've discussed that today which is if you're a woman the cause of it is generally you're too far on your male side you need to come back more to the female side and do things which are more relaxing, more uh, peaceful, more loving, things that make you happy, prioritize that. But here's the rub is then, and then once you learn to do that, the, the, stress, the suffering goes away and then you can, the fourth truth, noble truth is then you can avoid it by keeping yourself in balance. And now what you do as a woman is you have to recognize that, oh, I'm off balance now. I shouldn't believe everything I feel. Remember, don't believe your feelings when you're not happy. When you're happy, believe your feelings. So I'm, because they're not always right, okay? So, so you want to believe those feelings that make you feel good. So you're way on your male side. Then you recognize I'm suffering. Why am I suffering? I need to go over to my female side. Now, here's the rub. Going to your female side doesn't feel natural at that point. What feels natural is to stay over on your male side. Coming back into balance, in most cases, does not feel natural. It feels good to go further out of balance, and yet it causes more suffering. It's kind of paradoxical, but mm. think about it. When I, I, if I eat ice cream, it puts on too much weight for me. You know, I can have it moderately at some times. You know, I'm 70 years old. My metabolism isn't what it used to be. So I know it's going to do that. But when I'm eating the ice cream, it sure feels right, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel good just to gobble down that ice <laughs> cream? It feels so good. Oh, I love it but then the consequences come later. So just because something feels good doesn't mean it's right. You have to also look at what are the consequences of it later. And in relationships, just saying your truth may feel good, but you have to look at what's the consequence. How does that affect that other person? Are they gonna feel defensive? Are they gonna feel attacked? Are they gonna feel unloved, unsupported? So it's like learning this dance of how to be authentically ourselves with our partners particularly when our hearts are open and not when our hearts are closed. That's our job. When our hearts are closed, it's my job to come back to finding love and then come to my partner and be authentic. Mm, makes sense. And just to close then, have you found for men and women that there are certain practices? We talked a lot about meditation, you know, forest walking, gratitude. Are there certain things that you found actually really suit 
a man as a daily practice or a woman, whether that's at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, just to really keep themselves in balance? Well, there's so many hundreds of ways of doing it. We call it the personal growth development. But keep in mind, it should be something for a woman that she loves to do, she enjoys doing, she feels no pressure to do it. Uh, it's enjoyment, things that make you feel enjoy. And for men, it's more about detachment. Uh, when he goes to the gym, he works out in the gym. You know, I do my muscle building thing. It's a big testosterone stimulator, stress, de de stress reducer for me. I meditate. I do that. I could watch the news just to distract myself from the things that are bothering me. And, and that's really important for men to do because our society is telling men that, you know, you should come home and share your feelings and be open. And that's just going to produce more estrogen. OK, so you need to take, take your time. And nobody needs to take it personally. And women need to be able to share what they feel and also know that no matter what they feel, you know, they're not always going to be perfect. They're going to say things that upset their partner is a partner needs to know nobody's perfect. And if she says certain things, it can be undone. A simple apology on her part will do it, particularly if she learns how to apologize for expressing negativity. Most women feel justified in expressing their negative emotions. We, we have a whole culture that justifies negative emotions as, well, I'm angry because you didn't do this. And I, yes, you are angry because you didn't do this. And I want to apologize for getting so angry because I love you and I never want to push you away. See, negativity is not loving. Negativity is not loving, but you will feel more negativity towards the people you love the most because you need them the most. You depend on them most. So, but you come from a place of, I wouldn't be upset if I didn't care or love you, but that doesn't mean my behavior at that time is loving or my expression of emotion is loving. So this is a radical idea, which is how about when you have negative emotions towards your partner to process them and then apologize for them and express more love. But you see, you'll never get to expressing more love until you realize that when you're angry, you're not loving, regardless of what caused your anger. When you're feeling hurt by your partner, you're blaming them as a bad guy or a bad woman. You've hurt me. I feel hurt by what you did. And then you process it and you come back and say, I'm so sorry I was making you into the bad guy because I know you're not the bad guy. That's a big leap for a lot of people, but we have to make that leap because what we've gone to in the world of feelings that we've grown into we justify our feelings. And if they're negative, we blame other people for them rather than acknowledge that, yeah, you know, this is my stuff that I'm dealing with. And if you can preface that, your partners will always be much more capable of loving you and giving you more. Mm. That's great advice. Great advice. Thank you so much. What's, um, I mean, people know where to find you. I don't need to say where you are. Um, obviously on but name your website I'm going to link to it all in the show notes where are you most okay. active and what what's new what's coming John because I know oh. you've said you're 70 but I'm sure that you're not retired by uh, any stretch oh. no I've got <laughs> six or seven more books at least that I'm thinking Amazing. about now but I'm doing uh, I, I'm working with my daughter Lauren she's 35 and she's mastered this stuff so I work with her on creating online courses and our most popular one is called how to get your me time for women only that's so that you're, that's exactly a course teaching women how to come back to their female side without depending on a man to do it. Then you can use a man to take you higher. So it's a wonderful course, how to get your me time. And, you know, we have an insiders club with videos and so forth. And I want to build a, a library of uh, courses for people that are more to the point, more practical. And Lauren is getting me to do that because I tend to just go all over the place. That sounds amazing. I love that. I kind of want to do that course myself, to be honest with you. Um, I will link to that in the show notes and also your website. Um, are you, do you spend much time on social media um, or does your daughter, are you doing it together now? Well, uh, mainly I do the social media. We, we have a website that has all kinds of blogs every week and everything, but I do Facebook uh, California time, 10 o'clock to one o'clock, three hours on Facebook every Thursday, Pacific time. Oh, amazing. And it's, it's a wonderful experience for everybody. And uh, then I, I also starting to do Clubhouse. I don't know if people know about Clubhouse, but yeah, I just did three, I, I just did 3000 people at Clubhouse my first time. So I'll probably go on there once a week, you know, Saturday night or something for people. Amazing. So they can see you live on Clubhouse and also in Facebook. Is that in a private Facebook community? Um, and no, it's open to the public. It's called, it's at, it's at John Gray, Mars, Venus, or Mars, Venus, John Gray. It's my business website or whatever it is, my business Facebook. 
Amazing. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.